If you'd like to turn to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy, chapter 1, page 1949. 1 Timothy, chapter 1, I'm going to read from verse 12. Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. And yet, I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost. And yet for this reason I found mercy in order that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered over to Satan, so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties, <coughs> supplications, intercessions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Saviour, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth for there is one God and one mediator also between God and men the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony born at the proper time and for this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and tell him the truth I'm not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. I want to just pick up seven things from these verses this morning. Simple truths for us to accept fully, completely, as trustworthy statements and truths delivered to us by Almighty God. The first thing I want us to think about is that Paul says he is thankful. He is thankful. He's a thankful servant. He's never losing the wonder of God's grace and God's call to him. It's very important, dear friends, that we never lose that sense of awe. That God himself, almighty God, before whom all angels worship and bow, 
crying holy, holy, holy. That very one, dear friends, has called us to serve him. I'm struck again, Lord, just through this, this week, the vanity, dear friends, of serving anything but Almighty God. And yet for, I don't know how long it was in your life, but for 28 years of my life I served all kinds of vain things. Pleasure and money and all kinds of vain glories until God in his great mercy and grace sovereignly and wonderfully intervened in my life, opened my eyes, drew me to himself, showed me my filthiness, my sinfulness and showed me Calvary, God's answer, that I might be saved. And Paul says he's thankful. He's thankful. For the privilege of serving Almighty God. Being called to minister the gospel. After being an enemy. A blasphemer. And a persecutor of the church. Turn to Luke 17. <clears throat> Jesus says, which of you, verse 7, having a slave ploughing or tending sheep will say to him, when he's come in from the field, come, immediately sit down to eat. Will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat, properly clothe yourself, serve me until I've eaten and drunk, and afterward you'll eat and drink? He does not thank the slave because he did the things which he commanded, does he? So you too. When you do all the things which are commanded, what should you say? I'm an unworthy Slave. They've done only what we ought to have done. What king? If he called you into service, would send you out to labor, and then when you came in, sit you down and feed you with royal bounty. That's what Jesus is saying. But God does, dear friends. And we can still grumble and be ungrateful to Him when our attitude should continually be we are unworthy, unprofitable servants. If we did everything that He required of us, we could still never repay Him for what He's done for us. We should be thankful, dear friends, shouldn't we? In the light of God's amazing grace. How sweet. Thankful servants. Paul goes on to say this <clears throat> second thing. He's completely and fully convinced. 100% it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance what? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. I hope you're convinced of that this morning. Why did Jesus come into the world? Bring us some nice teachings set as a good example for family life. He came to save sinners. What did we need? We needed someone who could pay the price for our sins. Someone who could fulfill 
the law's demand. And there was no one. So the hymn writer said, there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. And Paul says, to him therefore, be honor and glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Why should we honor him? Why should we worship him? Why should we glorify him? Because he came to save us, dear friends. He left the worship of angels. He left all glory, emptied himself took the form of a bondservant knowing that he'd be spat on knowing that he'd be rejected knowing that God would make him sin and judge him in our place that all the fearsome wrath of God would fall upon him That he was to suffer beyond anything that anyone would ever know. Mad beyond any man. And it was way more than human suffering, dear friends. It was the reproach of the Father that broke his heart. God saw the anguish of his soul and was satisfied. He paid that price. He came into the world for that very reason. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 says we should remember what we were. Verse 11, remember formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who called on circumcision by the so-called circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember, you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He made peace. He made peace. He brought us back. We had no hope. We had nothing, dear friends. We were in darkness. The wrath of God was upon us. I don't know if you ever had days of gloom, like there was a great cloud over here, but if you'd only realized the wrath of God was upon you, and we walked without hope and without God as enemies of God for so long. But while we were without hope, helpless to do anything to bring us back, at the right time Christ came and died for our sins. The next thing Paul says is this. Remember you're in a battle. Remember you're in a battle. You've been entrusted with the gospel and you need to be watchful because you need to fight the good fight of faith. There's an enemy who wants to destroy you. We're in a world which is at enmity with our blessed Saviour. And we've only to look around us to see that there are people who once walked who have now departed living their lives a, a crash a, a, a disaster they've departed they're shipwrecked 
And Paul says we need to be careful to keep a good conscience. God's made it simple, dear friends. We're born again. God puts the help of the Holy Spirit within us. To bring a conviction into our lives if we respond to him. We can walk with God in peace. If we listen to that still small voice. And when he says no. We stay away. When he says you shouldn't have done that we confess. When he quickens us to go somewhere we go. When we're obedient to listen to his voice and obey, we can walk in peace. We can walk that narrow way and we can walk in fellowship with him. What an amazing thing. Enoch walked with God for 300 years. So don't say you're tired after 10 or 15. 300 years he walked with God, dear friends. You say, oh, well, it, it can't have been as bad. It was the days of Noah. It was on a downhill spiral, dear friends, in the days of Enoch. But he walked with God. And then God took him up. And Paul says, remember, remember, you've been entrusted and you're in a battle. So keep a good conscience. And watch out. <clears throat> Learn from those whose lives are now a shipwreck. The fourth thing <clears throat> that Paul says is this. God wants all men to be prayed for. Amen? Amen. That it's of first importance to God. When Jesus went into the temple and they were up to all sorts, they were selling their latest book, God Wants You Rich and Successful. They were up to all kinds of things. Profiteering in the house of God. That would never happen now, would it? It stirred his wrath, dear friends. And he prepared a, a, a good weapon. <laughs> And he went through the house. He turned over the tables, dear friends. Get these things out of here. Why? My house should be a house of prayer. We make his house a house of all kinds of things, don't we? A house of social activities. A house of Bible studies and all kinds of activity. A house of prayer, dear friends. First of all, of first importance, Paul says, we need to gather together to seek God and pray. We need to pray for our government. We need to pray for our nation that there'll be a fear of God in the land for the preaching of the gospel. Because the fear of God is the beginning, the beginning of wisdom and a good understanding. We need to pray, dear friends, and we need to gather together like never before. Jesus is coming back soon, and we need to sound an alarm and proclaim what? Solemn assemblies, because the day of the Lord is near, and it will come as 
destruction from the Almighty. Dear friends, the people all around us in our lives that we pass by, that we say hello to, that we do our business with, they're perishing and the clock is ticking and the day of God's wrath is soon approaching and we need to wake up. We need to shed our tears now before the Lord. Make sure you're well dried up, dear friends, for your unsaved loved ones and for all that those that you care about around you. Get down before God and cry before Him for their souls, for the opening of a door, for the Word of God, that they might hear, that they might be convicted of their sins. Paul says, God wants everybody prayed for. Especially those who persecute us. Especially those that are at enmity with the purposes of God. Pray for those that persecute you. Ephesians chapter 6. Having instructed God's people about the wrestling, the spiritual battle that we're in and the full provision of God's armor. In verse 18, Paul says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, with this in view, be on the alert, with all perseverance and petition, for what? For all the saints. Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Are you praying for the saints? Are you praying for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Because we're all ambassadors for Christ. We're representatives of his kingdom in this kingdom, this wayward land that's so far away from God and we represent him who's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. And Paul says we should be praying for one another that God will give us utterance, clarity and boldness in making known the gospel pray for me next week Lord I want to pray for Chris give him a boldness give him utterance, give him clarity help him to make Jesus known with everyone that comes across his path we should be praying that for one another dear friends all the time with all prayer and petition at all times God wants everyone prayed for what else chapter 2 verse 4 says God wants all men to be saved what does it say God wants all men to be saved 2 Peter chapter 3 Why is God putting up with the wickedness of this world dear friends? The nations are raging the peoples are devising vain things against the Lord and his anointed All the nations around Israel are, are, are intent upon its destruction. <coughs> there's an exaltation of man like there's never been seen since the Tower of Babel. An outpouring of filth and wickedness like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
and a violence in men's hearts just like the days of Noah. So why is God still putting up with it? 2 Peter 3 verse 9 The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness but is patient toward you not wishing for any to perish but for all to come to repentance, repentance dear friends. What is God waiting for? Repentance. repentance. What does God command all men? To repent. To repent. Can they? God doesn't command anyone to do something they can't do. <coughs> I believe that. If God calls me to do something, He will enable me to do it. If God commands all men everywhere to repent, if they're willing to turn, if they're willing to repent, God will help them and bring them to salvation. God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Acts chapter 17 says, Because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness and he's furnished proof of that by raising Jesus Christ, the judge of all the earth, from the dead. God wants all men prayed for. God wants all men to be saved. To repent. <clears throat> I hope you believe that. Because the next thing he says is that God wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. Turn to Romans chapter 10. If we believe that God wants all men to repent, that he's only putting up with the darkness and the wickedness of this world to give more opportunity for more people to repent, and God commands all men everywhere to repent. Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> I read from verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If we're willing to turn, if we're willing, To respond to God's command. Turn ye. Turn ye. Repent. Or perish. Repent. Turn. If we will turn. God will save. If we'll call upon him. He will do that work of regeneration. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. I don't know if when you were putting your socks on this morning, you looked down and thought, by their cracking feet then. What beautiful feet then. Forget the smell, they look lovely. Beautiful.
fearful faith if they bring good news. How lovely. On the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Be that voice in the wilderness. Calling people to repent. Turn to the Saviour. Flee from the wrath to come. But how will they flee except they're here? How can they believe in the gospel message unless they hear it? Mark chapter 16. Paul believed that all men needed to be prayed for. Paul believed that God wanted to save all men. And Paul believed that God wanted all men to come to a knowledge of the truth. Mark 16 verse 15. Jesus said to the disciples, Go into all the world. It's a three-letter word, isn't it? But it's so important. All the world. <coughs> and preach the gospel to all creation. Every creature. He who has believed and been baptized will be said. But he who disbelieved shall be condemned. Acts chapter 1. Verse 6, when the disciples had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? You're the Messiah. And you're supposed to sit on David's throne? And you're supposed to bring peace now to all the nations? Isn't this it? And you're going to restore everything? Is it this time? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and even to the remotest part of the earth. Don't spend more time working out where we are in the last days than you do spending time making the gospel known to needy sinners. Don't do it. We're not in darkness that the day should overtake us. We're all sons of light. And God has given us the scriptures and we should search the scriptures. We should look to the Lord. We should be watchful and praying every day. But the most important thing, dear friends, is still to make the gospel known. God wants all men to be prayed for. God wants all men to be saved. God wants all men to come to a knowledge of the truth. Luke chapter 24. Forty-seven, verse 47. The Christ had to come, suffer, rise again from the dead on the third day. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins. What can men do to be forgiven? They need to repent, dear friends. Can they be regenerated? Well, no one can regenerate themselves, dear friends. That's God's work. He's the saviour. Can people repent? Can people turn? 
Let's tell people what they can do to be saved. You must repent. You need to turn and you need to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to trust Him and His finished work and cry out to Him to forgive your sins and to turn your life around. And he who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, the sinner. I'm the sinner that you came to die for. I'm the sinner who needs a saviour. I'm the sinner who needs a change of heart. I'm the sinner who needs salvation. We need to instruct them in the gospel, dear friends. Tell people how to call upon Him. How can they call upon Him whom they've not heard about? They need the preacher. But we need to tell them the right thing. Acts chapter 2. Peter on the day of Pentecost. Working with God, the Holy Spirit, the Helper. He, when He comes, will do what? He will convict the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. They were gathered to celebrate the giving of God's law and they would not kept it. And Peter stands up and says, the very Messiah who alone could fulfill that law, you've crucified him. God sent him and you've nailed him to a cross at the hands of sinful men. And it says they were pierced to the heart. Pierced. The Holy Spirit brought conviction upon their hearts because Peter stood up and made known the word of God. And they said, what shall we do? And what did they say? What did Peter say? Repent. Repent. Or you'll perish. Repent. Turn. Stop going your own way. Stop, turn around and flee from the wrath to come and be baptised was part of Peter's preaching. Verse 40, with many other words, it's my excuse, with many other words, He kept on solemnly testifying and exhorting them, Be saved. You need to be rescued. You have an enemy. And your enemy is Almighty God. You're on a collision course with the maker of the heavens and the earth who is holy and righteous and true and you've broken his law. You're an enemy by nature and the wrath of God abides upon you and you need to turn and flee for your life to be rescued. The good news is there's a saviour to rescue you and his name is Jesus. And he kept on solemnly warning them. Be saved. Get rescued. Get plucked out from the wrath of God. Jesus wants to take you out as a trophy of his grace. He's done it for me. And he can do it for you. With many other words he kept on exhorting them. Dear friends, don't give up. Did anybody here get saved the first time they heard the gospel? You can stick your hand up if you... The first time 
You heard the gospel. Praise God. Praise God. One. We need to be patient. Remember how stubborn you were? The next time somebody swears at you or snaps at you or rejects you. And remember, the wrath of God abides upon them. Paul says all men need to come to a knowledge of the truth. And one last thing. There's one mediator. There's no plan B, dear friends, for sinners. There's no escape clause. There's no second chance. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through him. Is there salvation in any other name? No. Is there some other name by which they might be saved? No. no. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. People need to meet with Jesus. People need to call upon Jesus. He's the only saviour. He's the only one who changes hearts. He's the only one who grants regeneration. He's the only one who turns people's lives around. Jesus. And God wants people to be saved. God wants people to hear this message. God wants people prayed for. And Paul says it's a trustworthy thing. It's deserving full acceptation. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. I was foremost. But God's called me now to serve him. And I'm so thankful. May I never grumble another day in my life because I have so much to thank him for. May I, like Paul, ever say to him be all glory, glory and honour and all God's people said Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these few verses that we've looked at this morning which remind us just how important it is to 100% accept the trustworthiness of your glorious word, this amazing work of salvation, what you have done for us, and for all of mankind. Lord, help us to pray with perseverance, Lord, in these last days for all the saints. Lord, we all struggle. We need that boldness by the Holy Spirit. We need that freedom of speech which only he brings, that utterance. Lord, we need that cutting edge that you would make your word that sharp two-edged sword to pierce men's hearts that we can tell them to turn that we can point them to the saviour and urge them to escape and be rescued in Jesus Lord what a glorious message help us Lord in these days to bear it with with thankfulness Lord we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.